Bip, 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 binge audio Bonjour Okaya. Bonjour Grace. Bienvenue dans cet euh, nouvel épisode bonus en anglais de Kif Taras, le podcast qui saute à pieds joints dans les questions raciales. Donc les mots qui vont suivre sont exceptionnellement en anglais. On fait un crossover avec un podcast néerlandais qui s'appelle Deep Sauce. Donc on va parler évidemment, comme d'habitude, de noirs, d'arabes, de blancs, euh, d'asiatiques, de roms, de musulmans, euh, voilà, de tout ce qui s'ensuit. Mais euh, cette fois-ci en anglais. Donc euh, nous vous remercions d'être à l'écoute. Our guest for today, our, our twin sister podcast from France. I hope you, I hope you agree with that. <laughs> yes, of we course, do. we of do. Course. We're very happy to have a, to have family in the Netherlands. All right, podcast family. It's a uh, so Kif Taras. Kif Taras is a binge audio podcast hosted by Rokaya Diallo and Gras Lee. Um, I had a look at the episodes, and that's why I kind of came up with, you know, our, it's our, our sisters. I can't really listen long and really understand fully what is, um, you know, um, you know, it's very hard to to follow a French conversation that goes over in a way, you know, in in a quick pace because French is so quick. Do you speak French? Um, you speak a little French. I speak. A, I'm Moroccan. I'm okay. Dutch Moroccan. I grew up in in the Netherlands, but I speak like Maghrebian French. So <laughs> when I used to travel to our cousins and our aunts in Barbès and in Saint Denis, um, but I don't think you would understand. I'll mix it with like Moroccan Arabic and <laughs> <laughs> make it work. Like in in Pantin, they understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> So we're super excited. So welcome, Rukia and Gras. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having so, us. Thank you. And we always like to introduce our guests with three questions that we kind of borrowed from the Surinamese community here in the Netherlands. And what they always ask is, who are you? What do you do? And where does your house live? Okay, uh, I'll start. My name is uh, Grace Lee. I am a, a writer and the co-host of the podcast Kif Taras with Rokaya Jalou. And my house is uh, somewhere around Paris. It looks a little Southeast Asian. It's also very French. And um, it's, um, it's, it's home to me. It's a mix of all these... Um, my, my heritage, my parents are um, Chinese Cambodians um, who came to France uh, in the 70s. And I was uh, born and uh, raised in France. So my house is a, a, a mix of all, everything that I have um, encountered uh, until now. How about so, you, Rokaya? <laughs> so my name is uh, Rokaya. Uh, we can say, I think in Morocco, people say Rokaya. So yeah, yeah. Aunt, her it's, name it's, is Rukhaya, yeah. yeah, so it's um so um what was the second? Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and a journalist and also a writer. And my house is in Paris where I was born actually. It's very close to the place I grew up in in the northeast of Paris. So it's uh yeah, it's the place where my parents came from Senegal. They came and they and they settled there. And I live in almost the same neighborhoods as I used to as a kid. <laughs> and how about you, you guys? Um, well, my name is Mariam Al Maslohi. Um, I live in The Hague, in the so-called city of justice and right, but that's not really true. Um, I live here for three years. I work actually in politics. Um, I work for a leftist political party. It's a local party. I do that with a lot of love and fatigue. Um, and I am one third of the Dips House podcast. We started in 2016. So that's what I do. And I kind of ended up also making other podcasts than this one. So I'm also a podcast producer, editor. And uh, so that's a little bit me. And sometimes my soul lives in, in Morocco and sometimes it comes to join me here. And ABC. ABC, yes. 
Yes, um, I'm originally from Ethiopia. I was born in Ethiopia, and I was actually 14 when I came to the Netherlands. So I was a, I was a, yeah, a teenager. And I, both my parents live here. I came here with my parents. Um, and my, because my, my father is a, he's a political refugee. He had to flee the revolution in the 70s. And um, what do I do? Oh, besides Dip South podcast, <laughs> I, um, I work for the Dutch Council for Culture as a policy advisor and communication. So we advise what happens to the millions that the government doles out to the various cultural institutions. That's a part-time job. And I'm also an editor of, I, I make books. Okay. We just published our, uh, I used to work, I have been working in the publishing world, in the literary publishing world for over 15 years. And two years ago, we decided to go solo with the the podcast. So Besides producing other podcasts and also an online magazine and essays, we also uh, we are publishing books. And our very first book just got published a month ago, the Dutch version of uh, the English "The Good Immigrant." Oh, congratulations! Yeah, congratulations! Has it been has, has it been trans- translated or is it only available in Dutch? No, no, no. That's that's the thing. We we did not want to translate from English. You had the English one. No, I was, I was, yeah, I was wondering if your book was available in any uh, other language. No, it's okay. only in, in Dutch because we just got published, and to, to translate it from Dutch into any other language, it, it's a lot of money, and yeah. we don't have that kind of. Uh, if, if a publishing house picks it up, it would be really interesting, because what we wanted to do was also, we kind of know the story of the Anglo-American immigrant experience because of the language. But whatever is happening on continental Europe, be it Dutch, French, German, Swedish, it's it's invisible. So that was the reason why we wanted to do like original Dutch stories and not necessarily translate it from. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I feel the same. I know a lot more about um, uh, things happening uh, across the Atlantic, for example, in the USA and um, less about uh, my home continent, Europe. Uh, and it's great to have this conversation with, with you um, because um, I think we we probably share a lot of uh, common things being women of color and also being Europeans because um, obviously uh, since 1957, the creation of uh, the European entity, I'm sure we share lots more in common regards to law, regards to I don't know, but just, just, um, just, yeah, many, many uh, uh, public conversations, and just having this one now is uh, is making this um, very interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, in Kif Taras, um, we, we we address uh, racial questions in France, and we have a ritual question that we ask our our guests. Uh, would you agree uh, to answer these th- this question? Of so. Course. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we ask our guests to um, um, situate, to, to, to tell us where they speak from uh, with regards to race matters. Uh, for example, I'm, my, I'm uh, perceived as an Asian, East Asian woman, uh, and Rokaya is perceived as a black woman. And um, do, do you girls, uh, are you perceived in a certain way and... Um, which one is it? Or do you perceive yourself? Uh, you, you already mentioned it, uh, uh, Mariam, uh, earlier. And uh, when did this start? That's so, such a good question. Um, I think, you know, I think first and foremost, I always see my identity as something very fluid. Fluid. So um, something that changes sometimes just only where I am, who I'm with, and what country I am. So in the Netherlands, I look at what identity of mine is extremely politicized. So me being a Moroccan Muslim woman is something that's being very politicized. That is a that is a discussion that is a subject to um, to discuss almost weekly. So I see that the subject on Twitter that that trends a lot is the hashtag Marocana, hashtag the Marocain, the Moroccans. Um, so that is an identity of mine that is spoken about a lot on TV by politicians in a, in a very racist way. But when I walk on the streets, 
I'm not I'm not necessarily recognized as a Moroccan woman. Um, there, I I um, I am an Afro Moroccan, so I am from the south of Morocco, where I have a strong heritage of um, uh, Black Moroccans, a heritage of what I don't know, but could be possible also um, of, of slavery. Um, so when I when I walk in the south of Morocco, I'm just like any other. When I walk the streets in the Netherlands. Um, I would have to start speaking Moroccan to be recognized as, as a Moroccan and maybe even as a, as a Muslim woman. So um, I speak from those layers of identity and depending on the conversation we have, I, I sometimes kind of decide from what starting point. If, for example, if I talk a lot about sexuality, um, me the, the, or the, the exotism of my Muslimness or Moroccanness or even Arabness um, is something that is put on to in discussion. So I could I it's it's a it's a it's a discussion I have internally also a lot. I, I think I could I could um, explain it like that. Um, you know, post 9-11, I think also in Paris, what I've what I've heard, 9-11 to grow up as a teenager in Europe, as a Muslim, your identity as a Muslim was something that was very highlighted. So um, I have lots of layers and today I will be speaking from all those layers <laughs> because we are here in that intersectional you know, space. And um, thank you. <laughs> What about you, Abyssé? Um, it's interesting when you asked that question, I wrote down what came to me first and as I'm going to say first what I wrote down. And then whilst Mariam was talking, I, I, I started rearranging my also very fluid identity, multiple identities. The first thing I wrote was like, I'm black first and then African, then Ethiopian, then Oromo. From I'm from the Oromo ethnic uh, group. But then again, all these are dependent on my geographical location, but also the the, the metaphysical world of specifically Europe and then Dutch whiteness. I think within the Dutch white space, I'm a black woman. That's that's how I'm perceived. And after living here for over, what, I think 25, 26, 27 years, that has become the identity that has been imposed upon me. And, and that's also the identity I've, I've accepted. But if I am within Dutch blackness, within the black Dutch community, then I become African black because the Dutch um, colonial history, uh, because the Dutch colonial history, the largest black community in the Netherlands, they are from the Afro-Caribbeans, from the Dutch Antilles, the, the six islands and Suriname. Those are the most visible black people in the Netherlands and people tend to uh, put me in that category because according to a lot of, I don't have like the typical Ethiopian East African look. But then within uh, the Ethiopian, the, within the African blackness, then I'm East African. I would identify as specifically the horn and sp especially with, with the, us Ethiopians and Somalis and Eritreans, we, we tend to get together. But then if I'm Ethiopian, then I'm Oromo first because of, uh, I don't know whether you know the situation in Ethiopia, because, but the Oromo ethnic group has, it's one of the largest ethnic groups in, in Ethiopia, but it's also one of the most oppressed ethnic groups where there's a lot of turmoil going on. So, and for me, I cannot hide my uh, Oromoness when I'm amongst Ethiopians because my parents gave me uh, in the 70s a very distinctly Oromo name. Ebisa is a very, or you cannot, there's no way that you can, mm -hmm not label me as a non-Oromo, whereas for sub survival reasons, a lot of Oromos back in the days gave Amhara names to their Oromo children. So with me, the, I cannot escape my Oromoness when I'm amongst Ethiopians. So that's the first thing they ask is like, that's a weird name, where are you from? <laughs> I even get that within, so what I'm trying to say is like, depend, even in the Netherlands, depending on who I am with, How, ident how, how I identify is fluid, but then mostly, yes, I'm a black woman, I would say, because I live in Europe. That would be like the, the main identity marker. Great. And um, 
How did you uh, ladies meet, and how was uh, the Dip yeah. South podcast created? What what was the what was the conversation that sparked the the creation of the podcast, and how would you define the podcast uh, um, uh, in uh, you know with regards to uh, the race matter, the way the race issue in, in the Netherlands? So funny. I want to ask you the exact same ah, question. That's great. <laughs> so we <we'll> answer <laughs> after you. <laughs> you will answer after us. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, I love this. I love this. Like, we're all so curious. Like, oh, but what do you? And then, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So we started in 2016. And so I, me, Abise and Anusha, the three of us, we kind of knew each other just from Twitter, from the Twitter community. Let's call it that. And but we were interviewed, um, but not with Abise, with four other women of color and black women. And we talked about um, race, using social media. And we kind of I don't think we made the mistake. I think we let a white journalist interview us, a white male journalist. And we made some very, very strict um, 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 agreements, and those agreements were not honored. So what happened was that a, a article was published that was uh, that that led to a, a, a meltdown <laughs> in the Netherlands, where we kind of said what we are saying, and I'm pretty sure you are saying in in the podcast that we have a, we have a racism problem, and we have a problem with. Um, um, how uh, we, even as women of color, as black women, can move through this country, work, etc. And so we we didn't really know each other that well, but because we are we were so under a magnifying glass, and because we were attacked constantly, we created this WhatsApp group app and started. Ex- talking about, you know, our experiences, what is going on, about the debate in the Netherlands, etc. And then we thought, you know what, we have this safe space now, but, but what if we just throw it into the world and into the, Nether- in the, in the Netherlands? And that's how Dipsos actually was created. And we're going strong now for you, you forget Sorry. one tiny detail. The three of us, we met at different stages before That's we true. started the podcast because Anusha, uh, Anusha is like, she's our eldest as well. She has been, um, how do you say it? Uh, she's been an activist. Quite, she, she's, she's relatively well known in the Netherlands. She's, she's a writer. A yeah. She's an actress. She, she's done, uh, she, she, she has been a public figure for a long time, but she was one of the few outspoken black women since the beginning of days she was one of the she's she's one of the trail blazers and she'd have to deal with all of this on her own for a long time but we met i met mariam at a protest yeah first first time we actually met it was not well, first it was twitter but then the first time we saw each other was at a protest and the same with anusha the first time i actually saw her in real life was another anti-racism protest so even if before we knew that Dips House was going to happen, we actually physically met at anti-racism yeah. protests. I just wanted to add that. <laughs> what about you? What about yes, you? Yes, we, we want to know now about you. <laughs> so it's 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 a it's a different story because we knew each other. We were already friends. And we were keeping having those conversations about racism, how Grace, as a, as an Asian woman, was experiencing race in in France, and how it was different from my own experience, and how in some ways it could be similar. So we're having those conversations with you know the two of us or with other friends, and at some point we you know we just you know have that conversation saying oh maybe we could have this conversation you know in a more in a more public way. And uh, trying to, to create a space where we could have that conversation, but not in, in the, the tra- traditional way, because here in France, we have many debates, TV debates, where you have people discussing race the, or the French yeah. identity, but in a very, very aggressive way, like something that is not peaceful at all. And it's mostly, you know, among white people, just speaking about people who are not there. And it's very, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, very peaceful conversation. So we decided to first have just um, invite to invite two of our friends, uh, Fatima Aidbunua and Samira Ibrahim, to have a, a, a taped conversations, like a video conversation. Um, okay. And yeah, it was just 
you know, we didn't have like we were thinking of um, creating a podcast, but we didn't really know how to do. So we just taped a video, and then I mm. met uh, Joel Rones, who is the head of uh, Binge Audio, and I, I remember I had a meeting with him, and I just sent him the link of the video, and I went to the meeting, and he was like, he understood everything that we wanted to do. And he, mm-hmm. asked, he asked me to just to get in touch with Grace so that we could have a, a first, um, how can you say that, a first... Um, a pilot. Yeah, a kind of pilot episode mm. with, cool. uh, with with two you, two guests. And that's how it started. I don't know if you have yeah. something more to add. Or yeah, I think uh, I think Rokaya said it really well. And I think what I can uh, relate with your experience is that Um, just like I think from what I understand from the Netherlands, uh, France has a problem with race. We cannot talk about race in a public manner, but it's it's supposed to stay intimate, you know, how we, we how we talk about race. It's we see France sees itself as a f- white country. And uh, actually, when I think of the Netherlands, I also think of a white country. I will see the tall, blonde, blue-eyed uh, <laughs> woman or, 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 or boy. Um, and uh, I think France markets itself as a white country. And therefore, um, with the colonial history that I inherited, because my parents come from Uh, an ex-colony, an ex-protectorate of, uh, of France, uh, Cambodia, and some countries in Southeast Asia, just such as Vietnam, Laos, were part of the French Empire yeah. back then. And I think that's what um, I found talking to Rokaya is that we are French and we are we were both born here, but we are seen as non-French by the French people themselves. So I guess this is something that I can relate to f- from your But what mm-hmm. you said, and also other European um, uh, uh, podcasts, we, we, we spoke to a, a British podcast called No Country for Young Women and from the BBC. And um, both of them also had this, um, this feeling of living in their country as foreigners. And that's something that um, I think will def- um, makes it very European as opposed to the USA. Uh, people who live in the USA maybe have they probably have a different story because the USA and Europe has, ha, have different stories obviously and, um, uh, and the relationship with with heritage is uh, is different and um, space space wise and time wise and I think that's that's, that's something that we, I, I can relate yeah. and mm. even regarding the the identity of the country of the US for example because race is structural to the US identity there is no way uh, uh, you know an American person can deny the fact that that you know black people have been there there forever or native people they've been there since even before uh, the US were labeled uh, the Uni- the United States of America whereas in Europe we still have this idea that people are, are coming j- j- that they are newcomers and and even if we've been here for centuries we are still seen as as, as people who just came yesterday and it's yeah. it's you know it's something that we need to 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 tell and to tell over and over Um, because there is no um, real consciousness, like uh, of the fact that we we are part of the European, uh, we've been part of the European history for a long time, and the Netherlands as well as France has been very strong and powerful colonial pa- colonial states. They've been part of the slave trade. They've been part of the invasion of the rest of the world, and they are still have those the the. the The legacy of that story in 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 their in their walls in the uh, traditions I've I've been covering a story about Zwarte Piet uh, in in your country mm. and it's something that yeah. is that is there that that we can you know we can see in the traditions in every 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 public space. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but that's comp- I, don't, I, don't, I I completely agree, and especially when the times I've I have visited France is. To, to us, I hope I can speak also for you, Ebisa, to us what has always been important is to have that conversation amongst us. Huh? Avec nous. What, who are we? And let's do that without... Um, what was so important to us is to do that without the interruption, I call it kind of the interruption of whiteness, so that we as people of color with and not with the erasure of where we are from and the erasure of what our experience is. I mean, my experience is very different than of Abise's and um, and Abise's dif- um, experience is different th- from mine, but that we at least have the conversation because we have something in common and that's we live in Europe or we live in the Netherlands. And that brings a certain, as you said, that brings a certain history and that brings a certain legacy. What I am... O- 
so interested in in when I when I uh, look at France and see how people of color interact in a different way when you have a colonizer in common. So, you know, I see a different relationship when it comes to North Africans with West Africans, uh, but specifically West African countries that have been colonized by 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 the French, because you have a language in common, you have a kind of a colonizer in common, which creates a very and I'm, I might be wrong, but I always had kind of the sense that the that the, the there was more closeness um, than we might have in in the Netherlands. I don't my my parents don't have don't do not remember the French marching through Morocco, uh, the Dutch marching through Morocco. Those were the French. So there was always created this kind of fake neutral way I should live my life here in the Netherlands because. We're new, we're newcomers, and we don't have that legacy in in Morocco, for example. But for the for, for the Surinamese, uh, like Abisa said, for the Indonesians, there is a colonial history, and I just hope that with our our conversations that we have, that we grow closer to each other and have that conversation. And that is something we tried also to do in in the book, for example, where it's intergenerational. It's um, you know, we make a difference between being black and being a non-black of color, um, and hope we have that conversation. If if I'm making any sense, <laughs> yeah, it's, it it is interesting. Um, the the situation in the Netherlands is in, indeed slightly different than the situation, for example, in the UK or France, specifically because of the after the Afro. Caribbean uh, community, the largest community uh, of color in the Netherlands are the Moroccan Dutch and the and the Turkish Dutch uh, migrants that came in the 70s for what's Hastarbeider? Migrant workers, uh, migrants workers, labor workers, the laborers. They they brought them in in large, just like in Germany. So as a result, because there is no colonial history with, uh, I mean, not the similar colonial history with with the second and third largest uh, Muslim community in the Netherlands, that the, 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 the system, the Dutch system has been able to divide and conquer. So as the, the people of color community in the Netherlands, the largest groups, the, the, the Afro-Black community and the Moroccan and the, and the Turkish community, they were not necessarily grouped together because they don't have similar, they had they both had colonial histories different from different vantage points. The Turk the Turks were not colonized by the Dutch. The Moroccans were not colonized by the Dutch. So it has a slightly different um, way of relating to the Dutch as as a colon colonizer than for example the Moroccans in France or the Moroccans in Belgium. That's what it makes it as it's a strange cocktail of whiteness that the Dutch have managed to create and the fact that the Dutch language is also like spoken in a very only few people compared to France, French and English, they have managed to create this Walhalla of freedom and mm -hmm. tolerance. The Dutch and their tolerance is like they're world famous. They export tolerance. It's a lie. I'm telling you now, it's a lie. <laughs> yes, I was going to ask you because that's the only thing I, I, well, that's not the only thing, but that's what I take from Amsterdam because, well, I only know Amsterdam from from the Netherlands. And we all, I always thought, oh, wow, they're, you know, they, they, they are so tolerant. They can smoke weed. Well, ever, no, they, from a long time, you know, now, and I know it's different now, but they can smoke weed and sex workers are treated differently than in other countries. And I also, I always had this idea that, you know, uh, Dutch people were more open minded. And I was wondering when and you said, uh, and you answered my question, that, um, not race, it's more drugs and sexual freedom and not necessarily race. Race was not part of the equation. Yeah, because I I, um, I remember when I when I when I spent some time in Amsterdam to to make that story about uh, like the, the, the slave um slave trade past uh, that it was trying to be hidden um, by people in in, in 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 the Netherlands. I remember that I interviewed um, a woman who tell who told me who reminded me that uh, the only uh, word in Dutch that was known by everyone in the world was apartheid, 
And I was like, um, oh, that's interesting. It's a Dutch word. Yes, it's Dutch. So uh-huh. it means that, you know, the country has been able to, uh, you know, to export a word that is very meaningful when we speak about uh, about race. And maybe we can share also what happened about uh, Zwarte Piet and all the resistance um, to remove that uh, very racist tradition uh, that was, you know, shown in, 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 in like the Facebook group and like when the when the person from the UN came and said that it was it was obviously racist because it was blackface and how you know people reacted and said that it was not it was not uh, connected to race at all and that, it sh- that the tradition shouldn't be removed and you know well I've been um, we call him the Nanders an act an anti Zwarte Piet activist um, for a couple of years now and it is excuse so me can you just explain for maybe for the french audience what is uh, what, what is Svarte Piet and um yes so Black the dutch Peach, have yeah. yes definitely i will do that good that you ask me the 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 it's in on the 5th of december the netherlands has the santa claus santa claus um celebration so that's a saint who brings gifts to i think it's the dutch version of the santa claus and it, uh, instead of christmas um but he has servants and those servants are of Moorish descent. So they are black and they are the servants. And, um, but this is a story that has a history, you know, there's always also said like before that, um, you know, the servants were only played out and not necessarily face painted. But the reality we have now is that these servants are made, are black faced. So white people paint them, their faces black and black Pete has to be this, um, happy, jolly, dancing, submissive character um, that uh, helps Santa Claus gives out, uh, give out the gifts to the children. But also in children's songs, he is used um, as, you know, as something bad, something dangerous. Like, um, you know, even um, there's a line that says, even if you're not, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, even if you don't look like him, um, uh, even though I am black, um, I'm not bad. That's what. <laughs> oh my god, that's too nice. Also, ben ik zwart als rood, toch ben ik goed. So even though I am, so. It's not, it's not only black, black, like it's not only painting the face. They also wear an afro, uh, you know. They wear an afro. Uh, they do uh, red lipstick. Exactly. Big big hoops, big yes. golden hoops. But also the the dress is mm-hmm. something from you know more servants back in the days, um, and at some point they introduced like the Surinamese Dutch accent, the the black Surinamese accent. So Swart Piet has a black Surinamese accent, and still they're saying all of this happened because the black Piet came through the chimney. So basically, if you're blonde and you have straight hair and blue eyes. If you go through a chimney, magically you tra- transform into a blackbird. It's, yeah. Yes, that's such a lie. It's the first world <laughs> country. They're yes. supposed to be advanced. Yeah. And so, so, so you have been, like so you have sorry? people 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 in the streets that they like when when it's time for uh, for celebrating Santa Claus, they just dressed in dress into themselves into into black pit. Yes, and their children. Oh my god! And like um, they, they do that in the streets. There is no yeah. okay. Yeah. So you know, Santa Claus comes from Spain by boat, but he brings all his servants. He brings Zwarte Pieter. He brings them Black Pete. He brings them with uh, with him, and then they do a parade. And yeah. in every city, if there's a parade yeah. in every city, it's is, 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 it, is, it, is, it, ha- is it still happening now? Yes. And how, as teenager and children, when you were a, a, a kid, when you were a teenager, uh, when you saw those parades in your city, what was? How did you feel, and how, how did it impact your self-esteem? This thing, I think, uh, Mariam, I don't know. I'm interested in your experience because I I did not grow up here. I was 14 when I came here, so I was never exposed. To, uh, there are a lot of black people who are exposed to it when they're born here. And they go, and their parents choose to let them celebrate the festivities because it's, a, it's specifically a children's uh, party. But the, a lot of black parents choose to not include black Pete in the celebrations. Whereas I was already four, 14. My father is uh, 
he was a revolutionary. He was an anti uh, imperial revolutionary. The first thing he did, we came on the first of December to the Netherlands. First time we came, he told he he sat us down, and his friends gave us presents. They said from Santa Santa Claus gave you presents, which was like it was very nice. They gave us gloves and um, scarves because it was really cold. I came from a very warm country. My ears were freezing off. That's what I and my <laughs> and after the guests left, he said, "You know what? Black Pete is racist." <laughs> <laughs> Week number one, he says, "We don't do that." I'm like, "Okay." So that was that's my first encounter was already okay. This is not something that I I need to even pretend to like. So mm-hmm. it was something that I was aware of from the day that I set foot here. So, and, and also because I, I, I did not, I grew up in Amsterdam, which is a very multi, multi, uh, racial city. I was able to avoid it entirely. It was easy to avoid, but if you don't live in a city. Yeah. Well, I do think that I, I did not grow up in a big city, uh, but it really depends, I think, what Abisha says, if you are, I know she went to a school with only people of color and only migrants, so, but I, 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 I was born and raised here, and I do remember seeing it for the first time, and me being petrified, I was shocked, I was, <laughs> I was completely shocked, um, my, my father is, 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 he would not, my, it's a funny thing, my father would not identify as black, but he would identify as Arab, but it is a black man. <laughs> he had an Afro and it reminded me of my dad. Uh, but I thought it was scary. What I always thought was so scary is that they paint their faces black, but the inside of their eyes stays white. So I always knew like, this is very, very strange. Now, of course I would, but at home we would not celebrate it at all. Um, uh, I think one time I told my mom, I want a present for Santa Claus. And then she bought me like the, ter- I remember the Teresa Barbie. That was the brown Barbie. <laughs> um, but other than that, I always found it a very weird. I did not necessarily know it was racist. I'm not going to admit and say that I always knew and um, that I always knew that it was racist. I did know that it had something to do about people that are black. Um, but it was until two th- for me personally until two th- 2011 uh, when one of our favorite activists Quincy Gario uh, stood next to the one of those parades with a t-shirt that said Zwarte Piet is racism uh, Black Piet is racism and he was arrested for it oh yeah yes. yeah, it's, for it's, a t-shirt it's, it's, yeah. he was arrested Violent, for wearing a t-shirt violently he was be- this black wow. man he was beaten down and arrested for just wearing a t-shirt um, alongside that parade. And that sparked really physical demonstrations alongside um, the, the parade. Now there has always been, you know, uh, especially black activists, especially black women who have spoken out against this ra- racist caricature. Um, but then really physical demonstrations started alongside the parade. And that, and that was, and that used to become very violent by the police. Police would really beat up activists, would corner them, mass, mass arrests. Um, all because you said that that character is, is, is racist. Wow. Yes. And yeah. Which was the proof that it was, that it was racist, like because beating a, a you know, a person on for the only reason of, you know, Quincy Gallo, because he was, he was wearing a t-shirt that really means, you know, they were just, they just, um, um, they just proved, pro- proved him good. Like they just, um, it, made him, made, they just made his point actually absolutely. by arresting him so brutally. And this really echoes with everything that's happened since May 2020, uh, I suppose I, I I don't know about the Netherlands, but here in in France we have heard a lot in the media about uh, Black Lives Matter from from the USA, but also from uh, black men in France that have died uh, under the hands of the police. And uh, also uh, statues of colonial um, figures being uh, un- beheaded. Well, not well. Yeah, we say "déboulonné" in French, yes. which means uh, that not only the he- not beheaded, but they were t- taken t- down. T- tear down, yes. Yeah. 
Um, is this something that uh, is happening also in the Netherlands, given the colonial history and uh, the, you know, the the presence of racism in in the institutions? One thing that I think is important uh, that we we want to discuss is the fact that we need to be Europe should be in conversation with each other because we tend to look at what's ha- also because of the Black Lives Matter movement. We yes. look too much towards the states. Yes, yeah, and definitely. Not be in conversation with each other because we have so many similar stories. And the thing is, especially in our community, in the in the activist community, we're very much aware of police brutality in France. We're very much aware of what's going on there. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay. If we don't speak the language, we know that it's like one of the brutal repression that's happening in, in, in France. We're aware of it. Okay. The interesting thing about, so when friends, my friends from Morocco moved to Paris to study there, I used to visit a lot and we walked on the Marche de la Dignité. Yeah, and it that was in was 20, 2015. Most, sorry? Mm-hmm. It was in 2015. It was one of the most impressive demonstrations I have seen. France does have a more, it has a stronger history of protest than the Netherlands does. So it makes sense to the images we see from France, from riots, we're kind of used to them because it's not all, we're not used to them always thinking, oh, it's writing. So it must be people of color. No, there was the, you know, when it comes to labor rights, we know that the France and even in Belgium have a much stronger history of that. So when we see that in, we, we kind of know that in um, in the Netherlands. And of course, when I, I remember the, the the story, and of course there are many stories after that, the story of Ziad and Buna in, in, in France that is, you know, something that still till today, there's no justice for uh, for it. But in the Netherlands, the Netherlands, I always say the Netherlands has the best PR team you can dream of. <laughs> they have the best public relations team you can dream of. In the Netherlands, relatively, there are, if you, we're only 17, we're only 17 million people. There is a lot of police brutality, but there are ways to cover it up. There is a way of covering up as something, as a confused person, um, or um, we don't have the transparency. We don't have in the Netherlands really also the the the, uh, the infrastructure to to monitor that in the way that we have it in, in that you, you have it in 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 France. Um, and that creates this image that also during when we had the Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations, um, um, there was one that we organized in The Hague specifically about police brutality. And that became a very sensitive topic because here we still like I know the French and I won't say them. I know how police is being called and cursed in French. But in the Netherlands, there's still a they really have a very strong PR team where even talking about police violence is like, oh, but but why are we trashing the people that are supposed to protect us? And that is a little bit what's going on um, right now here in, in the Netherlands. It's really interesting to see your point of view from another European country because I never really thought of... Um this as uh, you know for the french people because we as you said uh, we say we always look at um the usa and we never look at ourselves the same way and uh, it's really nice to 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 hear what uh, another european country has to say about the french um the french uh, activism and the protests uh, that are um it's it's going france on. is inspiring for us oh really it's inspiring because thank you because Because I think it's also the, the Dutch system of, 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 it's called Poldere, where it's a multi-party system. And they've, there's always a coalition. Mm-hmm. There's always a large coalition where four or five parties are involved. So like always compromising is how they have survived and become one of the richest countries in the world. They're merchants. Mm-hmm. A merchant always finds a middle way. And as a result, that has become part of our DNA. Also, like the people of color and the colonial subjects, we have internalized this compromising and nuance and always finding the middle way. So protesting, going, marching, revolution, fighting is not part of our DNA either. Mm. Not, the, the, not just the indigenous white Dutch, but also like... The, the Afro-Caribbean uh, subject who've, who've been a colonial subject for over hundreds of years, it's not part of part of our, mm. our modus operandi, whereas 
me coming from Ethiopia, yes, we did, because my again, it's also my own personal history. But in, indeed, when you look at France, it doesn't, I mean, the, the 35 hour work week. Yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah. Yeah. We don't compromise. <laughs> we <laughs> have yeah. from problems, but we, yeah, well, yeah. When people, when people are, are are angry, you you can feel them being angry. Yeah. They don't hide that. And that is that is something inspiring, and we oh, would wow. wish it is for mm. Dutch people to be more. Well, thank, thank you. you for sharing thank that. You. That's so interesting. Mm. And I want to say also, as a East Asian person, and uh, uh, here French. Asians have been speaking up against uh, anti-Asian racism that has targeted Asian people specifically ever, especially since COVID-19 uh, crisis, because oh, yeah. uh, it's it's even more, you know, uh, visible. And I want to um, uh, uh, talk about one account that I'm following uh, on Instagram. And it's, it's um, an account called Sorry, I, I really don't speak Dutch, so it's really... I'm not like uh, Mariam who can uh, uh, put French words at the end of her sentences. It's called <laughs> Bruge Kasmet Sambal, and it's an account... Bruge raised Kasmet Sambal. Yes. Oh! Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's it's a it's an account raising awareness and exposing racism against the Asian community in the Netherlands. And yeah. it's very I really like this account because I can see and I and I think it's it's important for us Europeans to unite because we are facing the same problems. And um, so so I I so if there are uh, listeners from the Dip South podcast that also want to to have a look at it in the Netherlands, or it's mostly written in 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 Dutch and sometimes in English. But it's uh, it's really interesting to, to to know that we're not alone in this. Hmm. Yes. And sorry, what does it mean that na- the 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 uh, the <laughs> broodkaas means uh, 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 a is a very typical Dutch. You know, like the, you French, you have your baguette. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You have a uh, broodkaas, which which means like basically a sandwich with cheese. Okay. Gouda, gouda cheese. Okay. okay. Of course, the 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 Asian. Uh, what is it? What is sambal? Um, It's like hot sauce. It's like hot Asian sauce. hot sauce. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Lovely. Thank oh. you. Thank, Thank you. you. For Thank you for the this. translation. <laughs> 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 So thank you so much. It was so yes. it was so nice to share. It's too fast. Like I have I have so many questions to yes. ask you. I hope we have another episode yes. to hear more about your experience in the Netherlands. And uh, there is so much to share. I totally agree with what you said about the fact that we need to share more about what's going on in, in Europe. Like not only in the, in the Netherlands and France, but also in Germany, in northern you know Europe, in Scandinavia, in uh, other countries, because we don't hear much about that. I think it's due to the languages because it's very difficult yeah. for us to access to some informations that are in local languages but still we need to to make that effort women of color unite <laughs> yes <laughs> we can do this i mean it's it's also possible to do this like structurally and try to find some kind of connection in to check in with each other yes yes absolutely definitely mm-hmm. and when, like policy which affects All of us. Like, for example, just uh, uh, recently there was a, a European res- resolution in the parliament to make uh, the, you know, the slave trade uh, a, cre- a crime against humanity. So that affects all of us. And it was yeah, something yeah. that was brought uh, to the to the EU parliament by European MPs. So that's something that we could, you know, Absolutely. be proud of and share together. Maybe we there is some policies that we can try to implement right. or to push from yeah. our, you know, home countries. Mm. Yes. I always say our victory is in 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 uniting. Because yes. other than that, we're Definitely. just battling our own own little beefs. You know, <laughs> oh no, I'm Moroccan. I don't have a problem with the French. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you, thank so, you much, so much, Evie and thank Mariam, thank you. and Dipsas, and um, hope to to talk to you soon. And please. Um, Uh, please, um, you know, subscribe to Dip Sauce and to Kif Taras, and hopefully we can uh, meet again soon. Definitely. <laughs> Thank merci you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. <laughs> Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. À bientôt. À bientôt. À bientôt. <laughs>
Merci d'avoir écouté cet épisode de Kif Taras bonus en anglais avec les femmes de Deep South, le podcast néerlandais sur les questions raciales. Notre podcast jumelle, non, podcast jumeau. Ouais. <rire> euh, vous pouvez bien sûr nous faire part de cet échange euh, sur les réseaux sociaux avec le hashtag Kif Taras sur Twitter et aussi avec le hat Kif Taras sur Twitter, sur Facebook et sur Instagram. Kif Taras est un podcast de Binge Audio, aujourd'hui enregistré par Zoom et réalisé réalisé par Adèle Itel El Madani, à l'édition Camille Rogage et Naomi Titi. Merci Grace. Merci Rokaya. 